this is how I imagine a, a, a real war between China and the United States would break out. My guest today, for the second time actually, is Major General Jim Molan. He's a senator in the Australian Parliament, a senator for New South Wales. Prior to his political career, he had a much decorated career in the Australian military. He served as the Army Attaché in Jakarta as a colonel between 1992 and 1994. In April 2004, he deployed for a year in Iraq, becoming Deputy Chief of Staff for Operations. He served during continuous and intensive combat operations. For his achievements, he was awarded the Distinguished Service Cross and the American Legion of Merit. He retired from the military in 2008 and in August of that year released his first book, Running the War in Iraq. Since his retirement from the military, he's contributed to the public discussion on Australian security and border policy and in 2017 became a New South Wales Senator in the Australian Federal Parliament. Frankly, I think he's the living embodiment of all that we admire and the best of, uh, and most courageous of the Australian tradition, uh, particularly in the military. Uh, but more than that, he's a powerful reminder to me, and I don't say this lightly, that very often the people who can best see the future and understand how to prepare it, us for it and take us into it are those who, in fact, can look back over quite a long lifetime of experiences. We undervalue this in our community. I'm very thankful indeed that Jim Molan does what he does in the Australian Senate. Uh, and I think what he has to say will be very interesting and important. Well, Jim, it's terrific to have you here uh, and to have another conversation, albeit about some very, very sobering issues. It's good to be back, John, and uh, we haven't spoken for a while. Yeah, well, uh, but we do need to talk. Uh, and it's very interesting that commentators everywhere, the serious commentators are saying that Afghanistan needs to be seen for a, as for the giant wake-up call that it is. Now, I, I don't want today to focus on the terrible tragedy that that is for the Afghani people. Uh, that's playing out on our television sets every night. It ought to be pricking our consciences. It ought to be reminding us of how dreadful really bad belief systems can be for people who are subjected to them, all of those factors. Uh, but what I want to talk to you, Jim, about today is to have a discussion about the reality that it reminds us that the world is a very dangerous place, that um, great and powerful nations have come to grief in Afghanistan. It's happened again now. In these very uncertain times, Paul Kelly, the hugely respected editor-at-large of The Australian, wrote last weekend that the, the route in Afghanistan means we need to, and I quote, rethink the US alliance in terms of our rhetoric and our responsibilities and our self-reliance. That's a very, very big call indeed, but it does mirror what you've been saying, Jim. Why does this route mean that with more urgency than ever, we need to rethink our position. Uh, well, I have been saying it, John, and, and from memory, you're, you've been saying it too. I've been saying it since, since at least 2012 when the first indications of the change in our strategic environment started to become visible. Now, Paul is quite right. We must rethink the American alliance. In both the Iraq war and the Afghan war, we had no say in the strategy. And this is what blew me away when I went to Iraq. As Chief of Operations for the American Forces, I looked around for where the strategic guidance came from that decided what we would do, and I couldn't find it. I was very surprised I couldn't find it. We sent troops to Iraq and did what the Americans wanted us to do, and uh, uh, we didn't do that much, I must admit. But if it was NATO, they would have an organisation uh, of all NATO countries, 28 countries, which decided the strategy. And they tend to decide it before the war. Uh, and we have been subject to US strategy for far, far too long. We are a small country, but we're a regional superpower ourselves. We're a very good ally and we don't demand half enough say. Now, in relation to Afghanistan, we've seen a total and absolute collapse of a nation that we put 41 lives, many, many hundreds of our soldiers were badly injured, uh, and a lot of treasure into this. Yet again, did we demand a say in the strategy? That's the first thing. 
that I think that Australia has got to do in thinking about any alliance. So uh, I, I, am, I have the greatest respect for the US military. I think it is without doubt the best military in the world. All the myths that you hear about it, 99% of them are rubbish. The biggest weakness the Americans have is their political leadership. And Europe, it's amazing to see there's a conga line of British generals who are coming out now and saying, oh, it's terrible. We're not only, we're not only subject, in, uh, subject in Europe and NATO to American uh, directives, but now we're subject to American political directives with a weak president. Now, uh, these are the things that we have got to examine. In no way in the world should we step away from the Americans, but we must be much more hard-nosed. But you can't be hard-nosed if you're a tiny little country that doesn't take its own resilience and self-reliance seriously and does not have a strong military. And that's the situation we're in. So Paul is quite right. Let's re-examine it. We're not going to do a runner on the Americans, but we must work in our own interest because I hope we can get on to talk about the possibility that at some stage in the future, we may have to stand on our own two feet if America is defeated in the Western Pacific. Well, that's a truly horrendous uh, prospect. Uh, uh, so let's, let's come to this issue that you just touched on then. You have great confidence in the American military. We hear conflicting stories, uh, for example, that uh, Afghanistan and Iraq uh, campaigns massively degraded their equipment. Uh, it's worn out. They haven't replaced enough of it. Um, we hear uh, worrying concerns about the build-up of, um, of China's naval capacity versus America, although it's worth noting that American tonnage is still double China's tonnage and their technology is proven, whereas the Chinese isn't. Uh, but what is the real state of play there? The, the numbers must say something, Jim. Uh, the Americans have been reducing expenditure on defence. Obama particularly cut it very savagely. Well, uh, if you average out American defence in today's dollars, you get something like an average of $700 billion per year that the Americans spend on defence. When they go to war, they put a supplement on top of that to pay for the particular war. And as the US and us are invariably at war, uh, you, 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 you often see this. So, so the Americans are in the, mo are in the process at the moment of deciding what the next couple of years of their defence budget is going to be. When Obama, as you mentioned, when Obama was in uh, power uh, for a whole bunch of reasons, he, he, he cut the military's expenditure, the military budget, down to roughly $500 billion per year. That meant the American Navy had enormous problems in its training, in its continuation, in its maintenance. The vast number of American aircraft had run out of spares. And for a period of time there, the, the, the American Air Force, its F-18s, its F-22s in particular, uh, that all the money that was then put into defence to try and make up for that then went to the F-35 program, uh, which has not yet produced the vast number of aircraft, regardless of how good or bad there is, and that's this is still an unknown. Uh, and that has produced... An extraordinary situation. It's produced a situation where the the uh, the the U.S. Navy is now uh, is now roughly 300 uh, combat ships, combat surface ships. Uh, the the Chinese Navy is well and truly larger than that, in the vicinity of 400 combat ships. Uh, and the 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 latest generation of, of uh, Chinese combat ships, uh, you would have to. You, you, you would have to make the assumption in, in combat that they are as good as the Aegis class destroyers uh, that, 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 we, that we operate in the form of the air warfare destroyers and the beautiful American Aegis class cruisers that they have. Uh, the biggest advantage that China has in relation to fighting a war is firstly, they choose the time. Secondly, they choose the, the place. A world superpower will never be able to, uh, uh, under about six months to a year, will never be able to marshal sufficient forces in this part of the world to beat a, a mainland Asian power because it's very, very easy. Uh, China can have one focus for its, its, its rocketry, its space attack, its cyber attack, uh, its missile attack, its navy, its, under, its subsurface navy, uh, and for its army, in the area of what they call the first 
island chain. America has got fabulous shifts. Some of them happen to be in the Mediterranean, some in the Black Sea, some in the Baltic. Not much bloody good if you're going to fight a war in the first island chain. At the moment, I looked at the, I looked at the open source of material just yesterday. Of the 11 carrier strike groups that the Americans can put together and the nine amphibious uh, response groups, and an amphibious response group is, a, is a, a couple of thousand Marines plus about five or six ships. It's the one that goes up to Darwin. And a, and a, a carrier strike group consists of one of those magnificent uh, nuclear-powered ca uh, carriers plus a, you know, an attack submarine underneath and, and uh, surface ships all around it to protect it. At the moment, in the Pacific, we have carrier strike groups one. In the Pacific, we have amphibious reserve gr uh, re response groups one. All the others are in, in the Gulf, they're in, in, in the, in the uh, uh, Atlantic, or most of them are tied up at the moment, either rest and recreation for the crews or whatever. Now, they can, be, they can certainly be, be, be uh, 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 surged if there is a need to do it. But the biggest thing, John, I would say, this goes to attitude in a lot of ways. Australians will say to themselves, Bloody hell, we are, the, we are the ally of the greatest power in the world that the world has ever seen, the Americans. They have infinite US power, 11 battle groups, 11 carriers, 11 of these, thousands of aeroplanes. The reality, according to the Americans, is that since the end of the Cold War, American military power has decreased by 30 to 50 percent by their published uh, strategies. So, you know, when it comes down to, to figuring out what a nation's military power is, there's no point counting planes and tanks and, and ships and whatever. You've got to ask yourself, OK, what can it do? doesn't matter what they say or spend or have. It's what they can do. And the brilliance of the American strategy was at the end of the Cold War, they could win two major wars, maybe one in the Middle East, one in Europe, and a minor war, maybe South America somewhere. Total confidence they could do that. The last... 2017 or 18, the last national security strategy came out and said, we can win one major war. Uh, uh, then there's a few provisos on that and hold in a second. Now, this should have had Australia, uh, our Australian strategic community tearing their hair out and saying, we've been work we we've been putting 2% of our GDP into defence because the goddams could come along and do everything for us. They, you know, all through the Cold War, they could, they could rescue all their allies. Now it's changed. What happened? Nothing. Because, I, you know, I, be, I don't believe, John, we don't look at America in an intelligence sense the way we looked at Indonesia for decades, the way we look at China now and other possible adversaries. That's why Paul Kelly is right. We've got to look at America and our relationship with them again. That's why uh, 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 we, we must be part of alliances, but... Uh, we, for the last 75 years, you look at our record of alliances, and NATO is even worse than us. You look at our record of alliances, we have used our position in alliances as an excuse to not do much in defence. All that's got to change. I said to somebody the other day, we keep talking about net zero by 2050, and I'm not for a moment decrying the importance of climate. Not as a farmer, I'm not going to do that. But the other questions you ought to be asking, is there still going to be a place in a liberal global order, a rules-based system for a mid-sized country of, a, of 25 million or maybe with 35 million then? I don't know. Will there still be a place? Will we still be free, a land of opportunity, doing the things that we take for granted and undervalue at the moment? This question of attitude, I was talking to one of Australia's leading pollsters recently, and I won't mention his name because I haven't asked his permission, but... Um, we can take it as read that he knows what he's talking about. He said the Australian people at the moment are very worried about COVID and they get that it's knocked our economy off course and they're worried about the implications for jobs. So they want an economic plan back again. I said, what about the whole issue of defence? He said, no, they're surprisingly, and he said he, in his own words, uh, dangerously complacent because they think the government's got it under control and they don't have to worry about it. I'm not so comfortable. I actually take the view that if there's one thing uh, uh, our um, potential detractors uh, in China have done is that they've pulled their whole nation together with a singular focus. 
rebuilding China. We believe in China. We want, you know, have our objectives. I think we need a whole of nation willingness to recognise we need to delay some gratification now. We need to focus on restructuring the economy. We need to harden up our... I'm a farmer. Where are our strategic diesel reserves? 20 days is not enough. It goes on and on and on. I'm a great admirer. Obviously, I was part of a government that you're now part of, or that side of politics. And I have the yeah, utmost respect for the uh, defence personnel that we have there, our minister and our assistant minister. They're dealing with a lot of legacy issues. But this question of aligning the Australian people, of getting them to realise that our freedoms can't be taken for granted, seems to be a huge issue. I, I think it is a huge issue. And uh, in many, many ways, I agree with, agree with your, your pollster, mate. Uh, as a nation, we are complacent. Uh, the only thing I would say against that is every time I go on the media and speak about the kind of things we're speaking about now, I'm overwhelmed with Australians who come back of all groups. And I'm, I'm speaking to, to uh, university people on Thursday night, and, and I, I do that roughly once a week. Uh, they are deeply worried by where we are in the world, uh, our position in the world. There's no two ways about it. The most immediate problem is COVID and the economy. And, and I, you know, I have a total respect for the way that the Prime Minister is, is handling both, both issues. Uh, I think what blew me away recently with the Prime Minister was that he, we, we had been losing the narrative in relation to COVID and he came up with his four-stage plan. Now, that the, the four-stage plan was based on certain factors, had certain measurable things in it, had certain deliverables. It was a strategy of the first magnitude, and the impact of that strategy captured the narrative back towards the government side. Now, he's going to have to defend it till the day he dies because a couple of the premiers uh, and perhaps the opposition leader are hell-bent on, on, on knocking it back a bit. But that was a strategy which, in the midst of a crisis, he came up with, the, the, uh, you know, uh, uh, the, the organisation came up with, the, the National Cabinet agreed to, uh, and then into the future we go, we've got something to defend and we've got a narrative. The narrative is for us to base our defence on and for the people to understand what we're doing. We lack that in relation to national security. We've got nothing of the equivalent. You know, we, we hear some words that uh, most Australians who are complacent uh, think that national security is all to do with the military. So if you want to tick a box on national security, yeah, we're giving $270 billion to the military. And as you said, John, we've got, I think we've got a fabulous team together at, at the moment with, with uh, Peter Dutton, Andrew Hasty, uh, Melissa Price uh, and Karen Andrews uh, and Maurice Payne. That group together under the Prime Minister as our national security team, uh, I think that's as good as you get. The only issue I have is that uh, uh, each and every one of them seem to me to have an attitude which has been formed by the strategic environment which we've had for the last 75 years and not enough of the strategic, uh, uh, strategic environment that we face going into the future. And as a result of that, uh, we're doing great things. No one has done more for defence than... Uh, uh, than the, the government since 2013. No one has done more for aspects of national security, such as uh, our, our agencies or federal police, intelligence, uh, cyber, all of these good things. Uh, 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 no one has done more for national... national uh, and so you can't knock the government. But that's all legacy stuff now. The leap we've got to make as Australians is from the previous strategic environment where we just looked around and we saw the Americans somewhere behind us and they'll fix it up. And we provide very small forces as our down payment on freedom. Uh, and, uh, uh, but now uh, we may not be able to rely on the Americans. And because we haven't taken an analysis of the threat that we face far enough, we can't even assess whether we're doing anything like enough at the moment. So we've lost the narrative. The narrative on national security is just about defence and it's about our incompetence on submarines, on frigates, on tanks, uh, on war crimes and everything else. 
that's that that's what people are going to hear as we go into the next election not not a way ahead for the future not a recognition of what most Australians will say yeah we are worried about China so we're stuck in one strategic environment we've got to move through that we've got a good team that can do it and the PN's good when he gets when he goes strategic I believe he's got to go strategic now on this issue and I think <clears throat> to re-emphasize it for anybody who's listening or watching this well, I think what you and I are saying is that those commentators who are saying Afghanistan, and it's a debacle, it's an utter humiliation for the West, not just for America, for us as well, we've been part of it, it's not good. It ought to tip us into a much, much more realistic assessment of what needs to be done. That's our starting point. We've got another reset moment. And we need to grasp it now. As an aside, you as an ex-army man might recognise that that uh, is a, a World War II Ninth Division digger. It's not my father, but that's exactly as he would have appeared. And he was sent off to the Middle East. Uh, he was almost killed in Monty's big pushback against Rommel at Al Alamein. Wasn't expected to live, but did. And I lived in the shadow of war as I grew up, and it's given me an abhorrence of war and a deep and profound belief that if you want to avoid it, you prepare for it. An old Chinese saying, as it happens to be. Um, and so let's, let's just tease this issue out a little bit more. Uh, Churchill recognised, and there are great parallels today, that one of the problems was that much of the intelligentsia and the elites no longer believed in British democracy and the British way of life, and they were profoundly critical of their own culture. And indeed, there was the famous Oxford debate, I would not fight for king and country. Yeah. Uh, and that, of course, emboldened Mussolini and Hitler greatly. They thought, oh, the Brits, they've lost their willpower. They won't fight for freedom. Uh, we can roll over the top of them. And Churchill saw that. There is a parallel. I am astounded at what a terrible, frightful culture we apparently are, according to many of the elites who have very big megaphones in our society today. And I don't say we're perfect. But I'm not quite certain that they're telling people what the alternatives might be, nor can they point to a better way for ourselves. So before we go too much further down this road, it might be nice if some of our so-called experts who want to imply on just about every show and every Twitter account you can find and so forth that there's never been a worse, more racist, more sexist, more whatever society, that before we deconstruct it, before we play into the hands of the people who, or encourage in our young people that it's not worth defending our culture and our way of life, perhaps we ought to just stop and ask, what are your real agendas? What, what is it you really want? And, and I'd be surprised if we found out an enormous agenda that was running through this, this, this group. I think it's just naive ignorance. For most of these people, most of these people look for a, for a, for a cause and extreme climate could, might be their cause or wokeness might be their cause or racism might be their cause. Uh, and, and they're all, they're, there's an element of good in each one of those, in, in each one of those uh, uh, causes. But the thing that does comfort me was that uh, uh, we, we, the, uh, even though uh, society in the 20s and the 30s in, in Great Britain uh, uh, said what they said, they did fight. When the Brits have to fight, they did fight. However, in France, they were undermined from the inside and they collapsed in only a little bit longer than it took Afghanistan to collapse in the final in the final thing. So you go, I think in these in these lack of respect for yourself, you go past a certain point. Now I've had an, an awful lot to do before I came into politics and after I got out of the army with Israel. And I've done consultancies for the Israeli government and other things like that, where as a, a red team, we examined various tasks, such as the Hezbollah threat out of Lebanon or the ethics of, of one of the, uh, the, the Gaza wars. Uh, and we then reported to, to uh, the Israeli prime minister. We then went to the United Nations and reported it to the United Nations, who couldn't care less. Uh, but uh, it gave me an extraordinary confidence we are, uh, and, 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 and it's a confidence that goes against the, the acad academics who write, and I saw one yesterday, a very good person, who wrote that we need to be self-reliant, but we've owned, we're only a small country with a small defence force, etc., etc. Hell, we could be totally and absolutely self-reliant if we put our mind to it. 
uh, we could be a superpower in every area if we put our mind to it. We own a continent. There's 25 million of us. If you need to defend your country of 25 million, you probably only need about five, six, seven, eight, nine, ten percent to do the defending. The rest can do uh, everything else that needs to be done. Uh, we're in a fabulous strategic point of view. We're educated. We've got, you know, we've got a, a financial base. We've got a good economy, uh, and people don't seem to realise. And where this impacts on us is that is that, uh, and and I've seen many journalists do this. They still see the size and capability of our defence force and the nature of our society in a, a, a an either or situation. So they say, well, if you want more fighters you've got to give up submarines. If you want more submarines, you've got to give up frigates. If we could examine the threat that has faced us, not that it's going to come across the, the horizon tomorrow, but the worst case and the, and the most likely threat, you, would, you could justify in the eyes of the Australian people a significant increase in the Australian Defence Force and a, 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 an idea that we must build self-reliance in the nation, not self-sufficiency where we try and make everything, but self-reliance where we make things that we need, like liquid fuel, like diesel. That's an example of being self-reliant. And because the Israelis do it in with a vastly smaller population with no defendable borders because they have a central idea that unites their country. And you find as many Bolshe Israelis in, in Israel uh, as you as you find lefty, wokey, type people in this country. We could do it if we wanted to, John. We could we could do it if we wanted to. And the only people who are going to start doing so is doing that is the government. We are the government of national security uh, and we've got to fight to keep deserving that title. Okay, that's uh, a couple of, uh, you know, it's always interesting to cast your mind around and to also look at history. It's We talked about the last time we talked about defence. Uh, I think we made the observation and many people were really surprised when they heard us referring to it, that our economy is the same size as Russia and nobody messes with Russia. No one. All right, they've got a bigger population uh, and they have a more miserable, much more miserable standard of living or, or lesser standard of living. But militarily, same sized economy and no one mucks around with Russia. No one. Um, the other thing that's very interesting is that when the Brits did wake up, they really got amongst it. It's worth remembering that the Battle of Britain was a pivotal moment in history. It wouldn't have happened without Churchill, so a key individual made the difference because he led in the face of trenchant opposition. It's worth remembering that even Lord Reith at the BBC tried to silence him, tried to cancel him, tried to make sure he wasn't heard so often, and yet we owe our freedoms to that man having the courage to stand up. And when the message started to get through to the British people, it's worth, this is a really interesting little thing. In 1938, Britain had less than 100 fighter planes, less than 100, Spitfires and Hurricanes and other bits and pieces. By 1939, they'd got to 660. Now, the Germans had 4,000, but the 660, we know what they did, the Battle of Britain, they defended their homeland. So let's come, Jim, you've been, been doing a lot of deep thinking, because there's all the talk about what might happen. Now, no one thinks Australia is going to be an aggressor. No one thinks we're going to launch someone. No one thinks, for example, that we should try and be a country that could defend ourselves in a war against China and come out victorious, although we'll come back to defence of the homeland and how we interoperate with others in a moment. But you've been doing a lot of deep thinking. Everyone's talking about Taiwan, and there's warnings everywhere that China will move on Taiwan. What's your thinking in that area, and what would be the real objectives and the dangers for China, in your view? As, as I often say, that... That, that we should look at our own strategy. When we look at a foreign country like China, we must examine what their, what their strategic objectives are. And their strategic objective overwhelmingly is not to retake Taiwan. They talk about it all the time and it's a very big nationalistic thing that they're, that, that, that they're talking about. But that's not the be all and end all. The be all and end all for China at the moment under the Chinese Communist Party and President Xi is the reduction of American power initially in the Western Pacific, then in our full region, uh, uh, which enables them to be regionally dominant and perhaps sometime in the future to be world dominant. 
that is their overwhelming strategic objective. So Taiwan, which everyone's fascinated on Taiwan and they're looking at it, I think that most people who fascinate on it, they, they, they say, oh, well, the Chinese are going to cross 120 kilometres of, of strait and it's going to be very hard, this beach and that beach, and the, the, the Taiwanese have got these rockets and that rockets and they'll do this and they'll do that. Well, uh, if they did, uh, they may occupy Taiwan. There's no two ways about it. Uh, but they would be making and creating an America which in a period of time could move against them because America's, America's operational concepts uh, for a very long period of time, post-Second World War, has essentially been that if something bad happens, uh, such as the invasion of Kuwait, uh, they take six months, build up forces and then act very quickly. Uh, and uh, because they don't have in the area of where something is going to happen, many forces, those forces come from all over the world, they retrain, they build up, and then they do something, they do whatever the Americans want. That has been the operational concept. They've been running that concept in war game after war game after war game against a real Chinese Taiwan scenario. Now, my view is that the real Taiwan, the, the real Taiwanese scenario of China uh, acting to reduce American power, but using Taiwan as the mechanism doesn't relate only to Taiwan. If they do that, as I said before, they will get done. What the Chinese must seriously look at as an option is exactly as the Japanese did in World War II, exactly as the Japanese did when they attacked Pearl Harbor, is to attack American power in the Western Pacific before they attack Taiwan. So, so this is how I imagine a, a, a real war between China and the United States would break out. Now, we're collateral, we're, we're, we're bit players, and, and uh, I don't believe that in the first instance China's going to send 500 ships to, to uh, invade us. That would make them so vulnerable to the Americans who couldn't resist whacking them. Uh, I, uh, and, and we aren't the main game. We're not the main game. America is the main game. So this is what I think is likely to happen. We're in the midst of grey zone conflict now. We all know about grey zone conflict. That lies between normal competition and war. And we're, we see that almost every day. 14 demands on us, uh, uh, bribing politicians, attacking institutions, wolf diplomacy, etc. all of those kind of things. So that's going on at the moment. We could move up to enhanced grey zone conflict. And, and that enhanced grey zone conflict uh, has... Uh, would have uh, unattributable massive attacks in space, in cyber, uh, and other things like that that, that, that the Chinese uh, can, can, can do now and can think of. And, and this is what we Australians must look at and must analyse our own defence capability against. But the last, the third thing that I always look at is a war between China and the United States, where the objective is to drive the United States out of the Western Pacific and the mechanism is Taiwan. So the first thing that would ha would happen would be would be massive attacks in space, and uh, uh, the Chinese are more than capable of doing that. Uh, massive cyber attacks, and we haven't seen a full national cyber attack out of a country like Russia or 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 China yet. We've seen people playing around the edges. Uh, that that would cost us incredibly. At the same time. Can you just, just sorry, just illustrate what a, what a really serious cyber attack might look like? Uh, because that's chilling. Sorry to interrupt, but I just uh, think... Good. Uh, I, I'm, I'm not too sure myself, and I've asked to be briefed exactly on this, but I haven't got the briefings yet. I imagine that if people were serious about, uh, if a nation was serious about achieving a cyber attack, it could close down that everything that... It, it could close down just about everything that had a chip in it. The movement of, of, of all our food, uh, the, every pipeline system in Australia, every gas pipeline, every fuel pipeline, the, 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 our ports, uh, our banking system. Uh, and if you can do that, you can gain yourself days in a company, in a country. So if you attack the American, all of these things in America, at the same time as you're wiping out space capability uh, uh, and maybe even, wow, maybe even using biological uh, unattributable biological warfare, which kind of we're in at the moment, then then uh, you can you can give yourself hours, days, or maybe even weeks 
where your adversary will not come back at you. I hope to know much more about a massive cyber attack after the briefings I've been promised. So, uh, John, going on from there, uh, having done that, having uh, you know, and you can do that in a night. Having done that, the Chinese uh, would be fools to leave on Anderson Air Force Base on Guam hundreds and hundreds of brilliant American aeroplanes that are just waiting there to attack China. They would be fools to live on, uh, on Diego Garcia, uh, bombers uh, that can fly from Diego Garcia to attack bases, or from, from, from the Okinawa bases or the Japanese bases. And, and, and without being silly about it, the Chinese have more than the capability. They are the best in the world at rocketry and missiles. And they're, they're, when, you, when you overlay the strategic geography of the first and the second island chain with the range of Chinese rocketry and you look at the numbers of rockets and cruise missiles they have, uh, then you can see that, they, that, that if they choose the time and place, they can wipe every bit of American power in Japan, in Korea, in Guam uh, uh, and in anywhere else. And that's just about it at the moment. If you, if you let's not go as far as Pearl Harbor, uh, and maybe also in Diego Garcia, and and maybe in Darwin. If they did that in the first day or so, which is the equivalent of the attack on Pearl Harbor, if they did that in the first day or so, uh, the, the, and then they moved their their small groups of people out into the Philippines to prevent an American fleet when it comes together coming through the Philippines, and you can do that with small land-deployed anti-ship missiles, uh, 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 then you have created a situation where they've destroyed American power in the Western Pacific, they have fortified the first island chain, then they can take Taiwan at any time that they like. Now, if you reverse that, and take Taiwan first, and you're concentrating on Taiwan, the Americans might do something to you. I can see no military logic in that, and the Chinese are not stupid. So, so I, think, I think that if, if someone is talking about a war between China and the United States, which is based around a Taiwan scenario, let's just remember, I believe that the Chinese must add in the naval and air bases in, in, in Japan, in South Korea, in Guam, in Diego Garcia and in in, uh, in and possibly in Darwin, and then the Americans wake up after a couple of days and they say, "Bloody hell, we've got nothing to attack back. We can we can bring our other aircraft carriers from other seas. It's going to take us six months to get organised in this. They'll have submarines in the area. There's no two ways about it. And we just saw that three of their most powerful submarines, a deep suspicion that they have been deployed." into the Pacific, maybe it's because they haven't got any, any, any aircraft carriers there. Uh, 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 but the Chinese also have a significant anti-submarine capability. Who knows who will win all this? What I'm saying is that a prudent and logical planner would start with the, the real nature of the threat being the worst case, which I've just described, or maybe a more likely case, and I'm not too sure, I think the worst case is the more likely, but that could be a very interesting argument, that we would plan on that and then we would say, okay, what's that mean for Australia? What do we want to do for Australia? Maybe we could take that conversation a bit further, John. Well, I'd like to do that. Before we do it, uh, for the lay people amongst us, uh, you've commented a couple of times that uh, uh, our military is probably the best it's been for 75 years. It's just not necessarily the right military for what might be coming at us. Can you just give us a bit of a sketch? Because, you know, the, the, the man in the street, and I agree with you, by the way, that um, once you get past the elites who seem determined to turn a blind, or no, that's not fair, too many of them, to brush us under the carpet, not talk about it, go on and talk about other things that they think are more important, as though they could be pursued if we lost control of our sovereignty anyway. Um, but people, the, the man on the street thinks that what's happened with the submarines is a terrible reflection on our nation. It's timeliness, the nature of the decision, the fact that it's, uh, you know, we still don't know what we're getting. We're redesigning nuclear submarines to take them back to diesel technology. I thought actually we we're all meant to be stopping to use diesel over the next 15 years. But and this stuff's incredible. Then we hear really conflicting stories about the JSFs, and I should declare my interest. I was part of NSC when we made the decision to purchase them. Uh, we hear worries about the frigates being too heavy and too slow and not well enough tested. 
And I look at the Defence Minister, a man for whom I have the highest respect and think he's cleaning up all these legacy issues um, before we can even turn around and start to confront what you're talking about, the most realistic scenario and how do we prepare. So give, give us a thumbnail sketch, sketch of the Australian military at the moment, its size, its capability, its resilience, its relevance. Well, to begin with, it's tiny and it's brittle. Uh, it's not lethal enough. It can't reach out and do, do damage to an enemy. It's not sustainable in that it doesn't have the reserves and it's fundamentally a one-shot military uh, and it doesn't have the mass. So it's not big enough. Apart from that, it's going along swimming. <laughs> uh, so, so, you're not filling us with confidence. I know. I feel, I feel bad about this because I look at the military that I, that I spent 40 years in and I have a deep love for that military. Uh, but the whole military mindset refers now to the previous strategic environment where we put together a bunch of eye-pleasing capabilities, a couple of F-18s, uh, some troops, some special forces, an aerial refueler, uh, and we go across to the Middle East, we drop bombs on Syria and, and Iraq, uh, and, and we believe that, that we've met our needs for, for, the, the, for the American military. Now, now, in fact, we have. The American, we, that's all the Americans have been asking of us in the past. But that was a different situation. There is no way in the last 75 years did we face an existential threat. Now we face the possibility, is it 1% or is it 99%? We'll have that argument later. There is a, there is a possible developing uh, a threat in this region in the form of China, North Korea, Russia and Iran, which... Uh, which can prove to, which could prove in certain circumstances to be an existential threat to the liberal democracy that we know as Australia. I don't want to be in a situation where, in my life from 1950 to this day, I have lived through the best part of Australia. But as you say, we've, we've got to look at it slightly differently. We have three brigades, each of about 5,000 people. We have a very small army reserve. We, we are, we're starting the process of building some very good armoured vehicles and buying more armoured vehicles from the US so that because we have so few, few infantry, we can magnify that infantry. Uh, we, we have a Navy which, uh, having asked a significant Navy member, how many of the 40 points around Australia could you guarantee to keep clear in a, in a war uh, from, from sea mines? And, and sea mines today aren't those round spiky things that look like COVID, uh, attached to the bottom of the sea, they're like bloody submarines. You know, these things will come out, they'll sit there, they'll sit on the base, they'll go into a harbour by themselves, they'll sit on a base, listen to all the ships, pick the ship that they want, and they'll sink it. Uh, and, and the biggest nation in the world has conducted the most recent, largest since the end of the Second World War mining, sea mining exercise, is China in the stolen South China Seas around the, the Senkaku Islands. Now, uh, 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 so the, the Navy is fabulous. The, the air warfare destroyers are fabulous. We might find ourselves under a bit of a collateral ballistic missile attack if we have very important facilities in Australia that go to American power, which we do. Uh, uh, and so we, either, we, we don't have a ballistic missile defence. We, we could buy ships, sorry, we could buy what are called SM-6 missiles, put them on our air warfare destroyers and plug into the American system. And with a bit of luck, we'll shoot down some of the ballistic missiles that may come in our direction. But that then means that those ships have got to sit in certain positions and are lost. Uh, we've only got three of them. We, 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 we've got, uh, we, we've got the, the rest of the Navy is highly professional. It's probably under-missiled. Uh, it's probably uh, some of the ships are older. We're building new ships. We, you've got to do that. And we will see, you know, we've, we've got good submarines now. We're going to extend their life, hopefully, to match the new submarines we're building. Now, it's fabulous, fabulous when we didn't have the kind of possibility of the threats that we face nowadays. We need all of that now. The Prime Minister gave a fabulous speech on the 1st of July last year where he spoke about uh, uh, the fact that, uh, that conflict could occur accidentally, which could mean it could occur tomorrow, that we must, that the, the Defence Force must be ready now and ready in the future. Uh, we don't have the 10-year readiness 
uh, excuse that we've had for doing nothing over the last, you know, no, no, no conflict for 10 years. We no longer have that. He's rejected that because it was for the last 25 years. It has. It's been absolute rubbish. So so we 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 find now that the two hundred and seventy billion dollars that we that the government, God bless them, has put into defence, I believe over ten years. But I didn't think we had ten years. I, I, so we're, we're we're putting this money in over ten years. Uh, uh, I, in my view, it will produce a, a, a better defence force for what we have been producing over the last what what we have been doing over the last uh, seventy five years. It would in in a serious fight. It would last days. And I hate to say that, but someone's got to say it. If we analyse the kind of fights that it should go in, uh, I, you know, I listen to generals and I listen to defence scientists and I listen to officials who come and speak to our committees and I, 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 I'm thinking to myself, I've been listening to this stuff for 30 years and it doesn't change because we don't link the, 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 the likely future uh, uh, and the threats from the likely future with what we should have and what we sh what we could do. Uh, why? Because we don't have a strategy. We don't have the overall strategy. Our Air Force is very, very good, very high technology Air Force, but I reckon it would only last a couple of days in a serious fight as well. You know, 72 F-35s, uh, they could quite easily be a fabulous aircraft, uh, but fundamentally... They're, they're, they're an aircraft which was designed to operate under another American aircraft, the F-22, who shot everyone out of the skies. There's almost no F-22s in the world now. There's something like 60 combat-coded F-22s in the world out of 180 or so that were built. Uh, th this is why there is no logic and it is a massive failure on Australia's part for the people of Australia to trust governments when governments should be should be uh, op totally open with defence. And, and, and I say that for the simple reason, John, that our, our overall strategy has got to be to deter war. If yep. we abhor war, as you, as, you, as you say, the technique is to deter war. How do you deter war? Not by having a tiny little defence force, almost, you no, know, it, it's, it's a boutique defence force. You deter war by being a fabulously strong economy, by having your financials all in line, by being able to grow your own food, to innovate, to have sufficient industry in an emergency to innovate and to support you, and a strong defence force. And when you've got that, you say, look, possible adversaries, look what we are. We are truly self-reliant in this country, so don't push us around. We're resilient. If you push us around and hurt us, we don't care because we are resilient. We have a lethal defence force we, we have this defence force, which can, which is sustainable. They've got fight for a long time, uh, and it's big. It's big. It can fight in ten different places at the one time. I'd put to you, John, that our defence force can fight at the best in one place at the one time in the one battle, and against uh, and and whether all that fits together, I'm ashamed to say that my 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 life in the military and what I've studied since then would indicate we're nowhere near that. We don't test it often enough. We test parts of the Air Force brilliantly. We see we've got a we've got a Navy exercise running at the moment up around Guam. Uh, we've just been through a big Talisman Saber exercise with the Americans, and I've been through a few of these. And I don't want to be rude about them, but they're fundamentally stage managed to assist our allies. Yeah, we get good stuff out of it, but it doesn't test that we can win a war, and that's the basic thing. Yeah, I'd make a couple of points. One is that uh, many of the commentators, I think rightly, and you've referred to it when you've said we've not had enough say when we've interacted with the Americans. Surely now we're in a position where they will listen and the Prime Minister has done an incredible job of galvanising international attitudes. And he needs to, I think, be commended for that. And he needs to keep it up. But we, the Australian people, need to recognise too that as one... Ironically, and I certainly won't name this person, but a leading economist in Canberra said to me on the phone the other day, one of the best economists in the country, and he just said to me quietly, he said, for me, the three C's, he said at the moment, COVID plus climate is still less of a worry than the biggest one of all, which is China. We've actually, was an interesting comment. 
uh, and it came from, I, I was very surprised, but that was the way that he saw it. It does need that national focus. Um, I guess to wrap it up then, we're saying that we're all in this together. We need to recognise Afghanistan is, if you like, it's pulled us up sharply. It's made us realise that we can't assume anything anymore, that even with the best will in the world, America, uh, the American military for its might is still operated by a political system that's ungirded by, undergirded by a divided America. Uh, and we in Australia need to recognise that we've just simply got to pull together as a wealthy mid-sized nation a long way as a democracy goes from uh, a lot of our friends. Um, there's a, a need for a collective development of a collective willpower here and a determination. And the first question is, do we really believe in ourselves? Yeah. Uh, you, you're right. And and it, we haven't really had to believe in ourselves uh, 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 for a long, long time because we haven't been challenged the way we're being challenged now. Uh, I still have a, either a hope or a belief that we do believe in ourselves deep down, that middle Australia will come together. You can leave all the ratbags and the wokies and the lefties all over the place doing their own thing. We will come together because this is an extraordinary country. This is a man Australia is a manifestation of every part of the Enlightenment. Uh, and we've just got to keep fighting for the ideas, fighting for confidence. But if I had to sum it up for myself in what we've been talking about now for a while, uh, I'd say that war is possible. War is more likely than most commentators are saying at the moment, but war is not inevitable. I'd say in order to assess how prepared we are, which is the prudent thing to do, we must analyse the specific threat, not wishy-washy words that hide weakness and generalisations, the specific threat. For the first time for 75 years, we can make judgments about a sufficient, a specific threat and say how we meet them. It is a deep problem, John, and the first thing and the most important thing to do is to work out a national strategy for the nation and for the Defence Force. Well, Jim, um, it's an incredible thing that you do when many of your age might be thinking about being grown nomad, grey nomads resting on their laurels and so forth. You're actually out there in the vanguard. You're the living proof that the future is often best identified and tackled by people who have lived a great deal in the past. That's one of the cultural issues we have, uh, that too many younger people think all wisdom resides with them. But you're right. Uh, I meet this all the time. Australians everywhere who are deeply concerned and want leadership. Uh, well, uh, you're providing a great deal of it. And... Uh, all I can say is all strength to your right arm. Keep it up for as long as you can. We're very glad that you're up on about again after you know, a, a, a quite challenging health issue and uh, you tackled it with gutsiness and it's good to see you live and firing on all eight. So thank you very much indeed, Jim. John, thank you very much and thank you for what you do, which I find absolutely inspirational and fascinating. Thank you very, very much. Thanks, Jim. Thank you for watching this episode. We appreciate your support. If you value vital conversations like this one, be sure to subscribe to the channel there and also click the notification bell to stay up to date with new releases.